Uh, I'm Hazel Genn, Dean of the Faculty of Laws. It is my great pleasure to welcome you all this evening to Professor Cheryl Thomas's inaugural lecture. Uh, it is a landmark event for UCL and for the Faculty of Laws to appoint the first chair of judicial studies in the United Kingdom. It's also a personal pleasure for me because Cheryl is someone that I have worked for, uh, worked with. <laughs> Uh, and uh, for whose range of skills and experience I have enormous admiration. The inaugural lecture is a rite of passage. It's an opportunity for a new professor to inform a wide audience about their field of expertise and their research programme. The Faculty of Laws is an opportunity to mark this significant appointment and to showcase the range and quality of research that the faculty fosters and promotes. I want to explain that there are two things in front of each of you on your little desks. There is a gadget, and Cheryl is going to explain the purpose of the gadget in a moment. There is also a small white box, which is your take-home gift. You see. It's a USB stick with the Judicial Institute's logo on it. Uh, anyway, so my main task, which is to introduce our chair this evening, we are honoured to have in the chair Lady Justice Hallett, one of the most senior judges in England and Wales. She's a judge of the Court of Appeal, Vice President of the Queen's Bench Division, Chairman of the Judicial College, and a member of the Judicial Ex Executive Board, which is the most senior committee of judges in England and Wales. From 2006 to 10, she was an inaugural commissioner and vice chair of the Judicial Appointments Commission, where she worked tirelessly and very effectively to bridge the gap between lay commissioners and judicial colleagues. Lady Justice Hallett has had a distinguished career both as a barrister and then as a judge. She combines outstanding legal skills with a down-to-earth humanity that is much valued. She became known to the general public as the coroner in charge of the inquest into the London underground bombings that took place in July 2005. She received wide publicity for the skill, sympathy, efficiency, and sheer good judgment that she demonstrated during the course of a grueling five months in which she dealt with evidence from more than 500 witnesses. Lady Justice Hallett has been a great friend of the faculty, serving as our 2012 Bentham President. We are delighted that she will soon become an alumna, having graciously agreed to accept an honorary LLD from UCL, which is going to be awarded later this year. I'm now going to leave the proceedings in her most capable hands and allow her to introduce Professor Cheryl Thomas. Thank you, Lady Mrs. Hallett. As you've heard, I've become something of a regular visitor to UCL in recent years, albeit I didn't study here, and I'm beginning to feel I've been adopted. If so, I owe my privileged position to two remarkable women. One, Professor Dame Hazel Genn, from whom you've just heard, and the other, Professor Gerald Thomas. Between them, they know more about the judicial system and the judges, and the judges themselves. It is the achievements of Professor Cheryl Thomas that we're here to celebrate this evening, and in particular, her appointment to the first chair in judicial studies in the UK. If there's one word that leaps off the page or off the screen when reading about her work, it is innovation. She boldly studies where few in the UK have studied before. <coughs> Academic research into judges and jurors has been extraordinarily limited given the importance of the jobs that they do. The attitude for many years has been, what more does one need to know? Judges are judges, juries are juries. What more can one know given the constraints? Yet from the day of their appointment, judges are let loose upon the public with as much induction training as resources will permit, but otherwise allegedly fully fledged. Juries are selected at random and forced to sit in judgment on their peers without any training whatsoever. Professor Thomas wanted to know more about what we expect of them and how they set about their tasks. And she has made judicial studies a specialty. <coughs> She has conducted groundbreaking research in the United Kingdom and in other jurisdictions on juries, judicial decision-making, 
and the appointment and training of judges. Her 2007 study, Diversity and Fairness in the Jury System, and her 2010 study, Are Juries Fair?, tackled a number of sensitive and controversial issues about juries for the very first time in this country. She has served as a specialist consultant on judicial affairs to numerous organizations, some of them you may expect, some of them are not so obvious. They include the Lord Chancellor's Advisory Panel on Judicial Diversity, Her Majesty's Crown Prosecution Service Inspectorate, the Judicial College, but also the French Government, the European Commission, and the Council of Europe. Her background is unusual, but it may explain her inquisitive nature. She trained as a political scientist at Syracuse University's Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs. She then served as a political advisor in Washington, D.C. to the 50 governors of the United States before she returned to academic study at Oxford <coughs> University. She there obtained an MPhil in politics and a DPhil in politics and law. She subsequently became a senior research fellow at Oxford University's Centre for Socio-Legal Studies. Alongside her academic career, <coughs> she's had a dual career as a documentary producer, making programmes for the BBC, Channel 4 and ITV and she has served on the British Board of Film Classification. She joined UCL Law's faculty in 2007. She's a director of the UCL Jury <coughs> Project and co-director, along with Hazel Genn, of the UCL Judicial Institute. In 2010, she was appointed to the first chair in judicial <laughs> studies in the UK. You may think, therefore, it's about time we heard a formal lecture. Without further ado, it is my pleasure and my privilege to introduce Professor Thomas. And thank you all for coming. Um, I need to start with a few explanations. Uh, the first is to explain what to do with the object that looks like a small remote control in front of you. Um, we like to do things empirically at the Judicial Institute, um, and to get an idea of who is actually in the audience tonight, I'd like to ask you now to um, take part in a bit of audience participation and uh, to answer the following questions. Are you a judge? Now, there are enough judges in the room that I know that I better explain this with a little bit more detail. <laughs> Are you now, or have you ever been, a judge um, in any jurisdiction? So that covers any retired judges, visiting judges, and so on. If you are a judge, it's going to be really simple. You take this uh, remote control, and you press button number one. If you are not a judge, so if you have never had any judicial post uh, now or any time in, in your, uh, your life, please press button two. First, can I'm I, JP, what do I count as? <laughs> well, can I just say, you need to self-identify yourself. <laughs> if you feel you're a judge, some people may feel they're a judge even if they're not, um, please, please press button one. Can I also just make a point here, which is, you're totally anonymous, there's no way to trace it back to you, so I'm trusting that you'll all be as honest as possible, but feel free um, to, to vote. Um, and you'll know that your, your handset is working because when you press a button, a green light will appear. And if you make a mistake and you think, oh, I'm not a judge, oh, yes, I am a judge. <laughs> <laughs> and, and until, I, until I say stop, you can keep pressing the buttons and it will be the last button that you pressed. That is your final answer. Um, I'm, uh, it, it, does anyone need any more explanation? <laughs> Okay, um, because I can see that people, I can see here how many people have voted. Started yet. Yes, we have started. Uh, that's my partner, Mark, who of course will, will be asking the difficult questions tonight. Right, um, okay, well, let's, let's just see what the results are. Um, ah, okay, so we actually do have, I think, a very high proportion of judges, or people who think they're judges, here tonight. Um, 
Now, what I'd like to say is that was just a warm-up, and there will be a few more questions for you to answer in the course of this talk tonight. So, no going to sleep at the back. There will be questions asked. Um, it's time for my second explanation. Um, my second explanation is to those of you who, were, who are experiencing a sense of deja vu here tonight. Quite a few have told me that you thought you had already been to my UCL inaugural two years ago. And it is true that I gave a talk in 2010 about the report Our Jury's Fair. And at that talk, uh, Professor Dane Hayes, again, the Dean of the Law Faculty, uh, announced my appointment as Professor of Judicial Studies. Um, but exercising her power as Dean, she has refused to let that count as my inaugural. <laughs> so this evening for my official, if not my second inaugural, the question I want to pose is, why in the 21st century is there such a lack of understanding and scholarly research in this country about one of the key institutions of the state, <coughs> the judiciary? I've called this talk Purple Haze, and now I come to my next explanation. For those of you who are 60s rock fans in the audience, I'm afraid I will not be discussing the music of Jimi Hendrix, uh, nor will I be revealing any, <laughs> any previously unknown connection between him and the British judiciary. I've used the term Purple Haze to describe the current lack of empirical research on the judiciary in this country. And I chose the term purple haze in a direct reference to the term purple curtain. This expression was first coined a century ago in the United States to describe the lack of scholarship on judges and courts in that country at that time. Most of you will never, heard, will never have heard of the expression the purple curtain nor will you be familiar with the work of Sidney Ulmer, the American political scientist who first described the secrecy and lack of understanding that surrounded the workings of the judiciary in America in the 1960s as a purple curtain. Ulmer chose the term in a direct allusion to the Iron Curtain, which was capable at the time of immediately summing up the idea of powerful but secret forces Beyond, the public scrutiny, beyond public scrutiny and understanding. I chose the term purple haze because it is striking how much of what Ulmer and other American political scientists had to say about the purple curtain in the US in the 1960s that applies to the lack of understanding and scholarship on the judiciary in Britain today. But we live in a post-Iron Curtain world and therefore it is more appropriate to describe the lack of understanding about the British judiciary today as a purple haze. And this is the focus of my talk tonight. <coughs> I will first explain why we are in a purple haze in Britain. In doing so, I'm going to speak about judges and juries. Many of you will be familiar with my work uh, and my research on juries, and will perhaps be pleased to know that I'm not going to dwell too heavily on that here tonight, having already done that in my first inaugural. <laughs> but the point is that juries are judges. In this country, we rely upon members of the public as jurors to judge those accused of the most serious crimes. And judicial studies encompasses the empirical study of decision making by both professional and lay judges, such as juries and magistrates. My recent work with juries has dispelled the myth that the law prevents research with and about lay judges. A similar myth exists about researching the professional judiciary and judicial system in this country and has resulted in an academic vacuum about the judiciary in Britain today. Tonight I'm going to argue that the, this lack of judicial studies in the UK is unnecessary, unacceptable and even dangerous leaving our understanding of the judiciary both empirically and theoretically weak. To address this, I'm going to try and set out a blueprint for judicial studies in the UK and explore what contributions judicial studies can make to coherent debate and policy development in such key areas as constitutional reform, the justice system, and judicial appointments. 
So why is, it, why is it a problem if we're in a purple haze about courts and judges in Britain today? Why do we need to study the judiciary? The judiciary is the third branch of government, equal in importance to the legislature and executive in this country. The reality is that today there is not a single important social issue in our society that judges at some point are not asked to adjudicate. We want courts to sustain personal liberties, to end our racial tensions, to outlaw war and sweep contaminants from the globe. We ask courts to shield us from public wrong and private temptation, to penalize us for our transgressions, to adjust our private differences, to resuscitate our moribund business, to protect us prenatally, to marry us, to divorce us, and if not to bury us, to at least see to it that our funeral expenses are paid. This was the view expressed by Judge Shirley Hufstedler of the US Federal Court of Appeal. She may have expressed this view in 1971 and in the US, yet it aptly sums up the enormous social and political role we ask judges and courts to play in Britain today. From the scope of prenuptial agreements to the right to die, from national security to the boundaries of privacy in the digital age, from the enforcement of controversial international arrest warrants to the future of media regulation. Given the obvious significance of what judges and courts do, it is of fundamental importance to study the role the judiciary plays in the social and political process, how judges and courts make decisions, and what role judicial decision-making plays in the development, not just of law, but of society and the democratic process. This, in a nutshell, is judicial studies. Is there a single topic in law or public policy that would not benefit from a greater understanding of judges and judicial decision making? You won't be surprised to say, to know that I think not. Yet in the UK, the academic community has not really addre addressed the reality of judging or served the judiciary well with robust empirical research on the judicial process. The academic community has failed to recognize the central role played by the judiciary in society and failed to, to pursue an in-depth understanding of this key institution of state. <coughs> so how have we ended up in this purple haze? The purple haze here has exactly the same origins as the purple curtain in the US 50 years ago. It starts with a false belief in the need for ignorance in order to protect the judiciary, and ends up with academics believing the myth that judges and courts can't be studied. As Sidney Ulmer explained, the purple curtain that hides much of the doings of courts of law is no accident. An important function of obscuring what judges do when they decide cases is to sustain the myth of judicial objectivity. It is often argued that courts achieve legitimacy by perpetuating such myths and enveloping their decision-making in a cloud of secrecy. Jerome Frank, one of America's original legal realists, warned that it is a mistake to try and establish and maintain, through ignorance, public esteem for our courts. In this country, the false belief in the need to protect the judiciary from scrutiny was reflected in the Kilmuir rules. These were in fact not any formal, formally developed judicial code of conduct. These so-called rules about when judges should speak outside the courtroom were the personal views of the Lord Chancellor in 1955, written in a letter to the Director General of the BBC, in which he said, the overriding consideration is the importance of keeping the judiciary in this country insulated from the controversies of the day. So long as a judge keeps silent, his reputation for wisdom and impartiality remains unassailable. Whatever status the Kilmuir rules had was publicly abandoned by Lord, Lord Mackay at a press conference in 1987 when he first <coughs> became Lord Chancellor. And I do not believe that today there is a strong and widespread belief in this country in the need for ignorance about the judiciary and the judicial process. <coughs> 
It is true that the current master of the roles, Lord Newberger, who I'm very pleased to see here tonight, did recently question whether the large number of speeches being made by judges today may be, quote, devaluing the coinage or letting the judicial mass slip. But he was certainly not advocating a judicial vow of silence. The first principle of what may come to be known as the Newberger Rules states that, quote, judges with their wisdom and experience should be able to comment extrajudicially on a wide range of issues. And judges certainly do this on a regular basis in this country today. So where does the problem lie? The problem lies instead with the willingness of academics to, to believe the myth that what judges and courts actually do is beyond the scope of empirical examination. The American political scientist Theodore Becker, confronting a similar situation in the US in the 1960s, said, it seems to me foolish for researchers to accept any of these tales as they stand without challenge. And when Becker and his American colleagues did challenge these tales, they found the obstacles in their way, as he described them, no more formidable than a few cobwebs framing a threshold. And what followed in the US was five decades of empirical research about the judiciary. It started out with, a somewhat, with somewhat simplistic attempts to predict judicial decisions based on judges' personal background and political attitudes. But that research has grown to recognize that judicial decision-making is far more complex than this. It has increasingly become a search for empirical methods to explore the impact of a wide range of factors on judicial decision-making, such as legal rules, the process of decision writing, judges' workloads, and the relationship between judges on courts, as well as judges' awareness of the opinions of legal professionals, government, and the public. And while all of this was going on in the US, what was happening in Britain? Unlike their American counterparts, most British academics simply accepted the tales of the impossibility of studying the judiciary without challenge. The lack of judicial studies in Britain seems to suggest a fundamental lack of curiosity by academics in this country about one of the key institutions of the state. One of the drafters of the American Constitution, Alexander Hamilton, famously described the judiciary there as the least dangerous branch. But the lack, lack of judicial studies in this country suggests that British academics believe the judiciary is the least interesting branch. So what can ex explain this avoidance of the <coughs> empirical study of the judiciary? I believe there are two factors. First is the, is the divide between the subjects of law and political science in Britain. And the second is the divide between the legal profession and academia. Political science departments were the original home of judicial studies in the US. But in the UK, most of these departments are called politics departments, not political science, which I find really rather intriguing. Um, with such reluctance to even use the word science in their names, it's hardly surprising that virtually no empirical study of the judiciary has taken place in politics departments here. In law faculties, there is very little study of political science and very little empirical research. This is perhaps not surprising, given the finding of the, of the Nuffield Foundation's inquiry into empirical legal studies in 2006, which found that there were virtually no empirical legal researchers working in the UK who were under 30 years of age. And then there is the law itself. The legal profession, and in turn the judiciary, tend to operate in separate orbits from academia. There are few judges in law faculties and few academics in the judiciary. So while judges and academics are not in opposition to each other here, we are by and large strangers in our professional lives. So it is really not surprising then that academics accepted the myth that the judiciary cannot be studied and lost interest in the subject. And the result is that in this country, scholars have lost touch 
with the skills and theories about how to study the judiciary and judicial decision making. In my attempt to conduct judicial studies in the UK, I realize I have benefited enormously from two things. The first is the training I had in political science and judicial studies in the US. And the second is my naivete. Both were important, but I sometimes think my naive approach to judicial research in this country has probably been the most valuable. Valuable. I had no reason to believe any of the myths and simply assumed that the judiciary could be researched. So, what have I found when I've attempted to conduct empirical research on the judiciary here? Well, in terms of juries, and I will talk a bit about juries, when I was first asked to conduct research about juries in England and Wales in 2001, this is what I found. Outside of Professor Michael Zander, who I also think is here tonight, um, outside of his excellent study of juries for the Runciman Commission in 1992, there was a black hole in our actual knowledge of how the jury system operates. No empirical research had been conducted with and about juries for over 20 years outside of Michael Zander's study. And the reason for this was the myth of Section 8. Section 8 of the Contempt of Court Act 1981 makes it a criminal offence for anyone to obtain, disclose, or solicit any particulars of statements made, <coughs> opinions expressed, arguments advanced, or votes cast by members of a jury in the course of their deliberations. Section 8 was and continues to be routinely misinterpreted as preventing all research with actual juries in England and Wales. What I learned was the importance of not believing the myth. I looked at Section 8 and could see no impediment to detailed empirical <coughs> research with real juries on a wide range of important issues, such as who actually does jury service? How representative are they of the local community? Are juries racially biased? Do they refuse to convict defendants for certain offences or at, cer at certain courts? Do jurors understand judges' directions? Are they affected by media coverage? And how many of them are really using the internet to look for information about their cases during trial? These are just a few issues I've been able to research with actual juries at court in England and Wales. All of which, to me, shows that the idea that Section 8 somehow prevents us from understanding how the jury system works is nothing but a myth. And it is time to lay that myth to rest once and for all. Now, juries are judges, but what about the rest of the judiciary? What of the professional judiciary and the magistracy? If the state of our knowledge about juries in 2001 was a black hole, our knowledge <laughs> about the rest of the professional judiciary can only be compared to what astronomers call a supermassive black hole. And I'm reliably assured that this is what a supermassive black hole looks like. For over half a century, there has been little attempt at detailed empirical study of the judicial system and professional judiciary in this, in this country. There are isolated examples of individual scholars attempting to understand the reality of certain parts of the judicial system or process. John Griffith's attempt to interpret judicial decision making in Britain as a product of judges' conservative class background is perhaps the most widely known work. He argued that because members of the judiciary were mostly from the same class, they shared a unifying attitude of mind, a political position, which is primarily concerned to protect and conserve certain values and institutions. Griffith relied on a very small amount of empirical data to classify most senior judges as politically conservative. My point is not that his conclusions were contentious, which they were. It is that despite five editions of his book over 26 years, his claims have never been explored further by scholars through more substantive empirical research. It is true that over the years there have been individual empirical studies of specific parts of the judicial system in the UK, uh, 
and I'm just going to name a few. For instance, John Baldwin's work on small claims courts and Hazel Genn's work on tribunals and ADR. And recently, a few academics have ventured into interviewing judges, that includes Alan Patterson, who I think may be here as well tonight, um, and others have ventured into observing court proceedings, which has been done by Mavis McLean and Penny Derbyshire, to name two. But these are very much isolated examples. There is no body of empirical judicial scholarship that one can point to in Britain today. Uh, we can't blame the Kilmuir rules for this because from 1955 to 1987 there was nothing to prevent empirical analysis of judicial decision making in most courts in Britain. Most of the research undertaken in the US from the 1960s onwards did not require any special access to judges and was based on analysis of decisions that were all publicly available. But nothing similar took place in the UK. And even after the abolition of the Kilmuir rules in 1987, British academics seem to have simply continued to believe that the judiciary is out of bounds as a focus for empirical study. But like the case with juries, there is nothing to prevent empirical research on the professional judiciary and magistracy here. Personally, in my research, I have encountered no obstacles. I've been able to explore decision-making of vastly different judges, from those deciding case, cases in the first tier tribunals to those working in the lofty heights of the UK Supreme Court. I have also been able to examine in detail the decision-making process that takes place when judicial appointments are made. And just to go over a few of the studies um, that have been able to be conducted about the judiciary here. The tribunal study, which I'm carrying out with Hazel Genn, um, with the support of the Nuffield Foundation, is the first of its kind in the UK, in which a large number of tribunal panels around the country are deciding the same disability living allowance appeal. We've been able to insert the case into each panel's daily hearing schedule. And the study examines whether any of the following factors influence judicial decision making in this case. That is the evidence, the panel's interpretation of legal rules, the attitudes or personal background characteristics of panel members, panel members' experience of sitting on appeals, or the interaction between the panel members themselves. <laughs> Clearly this research requires cooperation from the judiciary. But the tribunal service, including former president of tribunals, Lord Carnworth, and the president of the Social Entitlement Chamber, Robert Marden, and hundreds of tribunal panel members around the country have all supported and facilitated this research. The next project uh, is the UK Supreme Court project. In this project, we have created a detailed, large-scale database of all UK Supreme Court cases. Its aim is not to reduce the work of the court simply to a statistical analysis of decisions. Instead, the aim is to use empirical analysis of court decisions as the basis for a more detailed understanding of the work of the court. The project will grow with the court's output and provide the material for a continuing longitudinal study of the UK Supreme Court as it develops over time. And in the Judicial Appointments Project, in that project, I was asked to conduct the first, and I have to say, sadly, still only, empirical analysis of the impact of the appointments process on diversity in the judiciary. This looked in detail at four competitions for deputy district judges. It examined diversity in a very comprehensive way, looking beyond just gender, ethnicity, and legal profession, to factors such as age, education, years in practice, legal specialization, and even income. It also looked in detail at the impact of each stage of the appointment process and examined the impact of who sits on selection panels. <coughs> I'd like to point out that this study was conducted in 2005, and it was the former Commission for Judicial Appointments who made the study possible by providing me with complete access to all applications and appointment process documents for these competitions. But my research on judges and the judicial process in the UK has really only scratched the surface. 
There are a very substantial number of aspects of the British judiciary that remain completely unstudied. So for instance, in this country, we know next to nothing about what the public, court users, lawyers, and even judges think are the most important qualities needed to be a judge. So, it's time to wake up. In the spirit of a bit of um, empirical exploration, what I'd like everyone to do now is to use your voting machines to answer this question. If you were in a position to select a judge, which factor would you consider the most important? If you feel it's personal integrity, then you'll press button one. If you think it's courtroom experience, that's button two. If you feel it's experience of real life, that's button three. And if you feel it's legal knowledge, that's number four. I'm aware of the fact that I'm only giving you one option, but it's, us, it's asking you, if you were in a position to select a judge, which factor would you consider the most important? Polling is now open. <laughs> and remember, if you change your mind, you can still, you still have a chance to press a different button. Results are in, and quite, actually, I have to say that that has taken me slightly by surprise. Um, not that there's anything wrong with personal integrity, <laughs> but um, like the empirical scholar that I am, I did pilot this with a small, obviously unrepresentative sample, and uh, we came up with quite a different result. Um, that is an interesting result. <laughs> I think one question would for, for everyone to consider is if that is the most important quality, um, it would be interesting to think how one measures personal integrity. As uh, for people on the Judicial Appointments Commission, that would be something to consider. Um, now, there is, it is also possible to separate you out a little bit more by your decision making. And what we have here is the judges are in blue and the rest of you are in red. So, actually, more judges than the rest of you think personal integrity is important. And more of you think legal knowledge is important compared to judges, which, again, is very interesting. Right. Um, what we've just done here tonight, I have to tell you, is the sum total of what we know empirically about, <laughs> about both judicial and public attitudes in England and Wales to selection criteria for judges. And, you know, that's amusing, but I have to say it's also a little bit worrying. Um, and what I want to explain to you is why what we've done here tonight does not technically qualify as judicial studies, as interesting as it was. Right. My approach to judicial studies is what I unashamedly call hardcore. Obviously the first rule is don't simply believe the story that judicial research cannot be done. But when empirical research is done about the judiciary, I believe it must meet three key criteria for it to be considered part of judicial studies. First, it must be realistic. For instance, most research that calls itself jury research is in fact not done with any actual jurors, but with volunteers or students, and does not use authentic case materials. As many of you will know, in both my jury and judicial decision-making research, I sometimes reconstruct actual cases and hearings on film. The challenge here is to ensure that these are believable 
when shown to actual <coughs> jurors or judges. In creating these films, I have been fortunate to have an expert advisor, Mark Davis, the person I pointed out to you earlier, who is one of the country's best documentary film editors. He knows what is and is not believable on film and has no hesitation in telling me so. So if my case materials can pass what I call the Davies test, I know they are realistic. The next requirement is that the research must be rigorous. One of the classic problems with any empirical research is having sample sizes that are not large enough or representative enough. What I put up on screen here is a data set we were able to use in the study Our Juries Fair, which covered over half a million charges against all defendants in all Crown Courts in England and Wales during 2006 and 2008. But a large data set is not enough. One of the most valuable assets an empirical researcher can have is a tough statistician. My research owes a great debt to Dr. Nigel Barmer, who is also here tonight. He has relentlessly encouraged me to increase the amount of data we collect, and he has made a significant contribution to the robustness of my jury and judges' research. If data can pass the Balmer test, you know it's rigorous. And finally, the research must be responsible. Most empirical research on the judicial process is looking only to discover problems. The research tends not to anticipate what will happen if problems are discovered. And as a consequence, there is no attempt to test possible solutions. My approach to judicial studies adopts a position of crime science expert Ronald Clark, who says that merely to explain and understand is to fiddle while Rome burns, or what I call the Nero test. Now, unfortunately, the results of the voting we've done tonight do not fulfill these three key criteria for judicial studies. It was not realistic. It does not reflect the appointments process because I forced you to select one quality for a judge. And there are a number of factors that are taken into consideration, obviously, in selecting judges. It was not exactly rigorous. This is a very small and perhaps skewed sample size. Uh, as a group, I'm pretty sure we are, aren't represent, representative of the general population, so we can't claim that this is what the public thinks. And while there are clearly quite a few judges in the audience here tonight, we can't claim that it represents what judges think, because we're not sure if this is a representative sample of judges. And therefore, it would not be responsible to suggest that this survey should be used when selecting judges. But I personally found it interesting, and more to the point, there would be value in rigorous and reliable research that discovers what judges as a whole, judges in different posts, legal professionals, court users, and the general public think are the most important qualities in judicial selection and for judges in different judicial posts. The results would not have to necessarily determine the selection criteria for judges, but surely shouldn't this kind of information exist so it can inform how judges are selected. So what is the effect of this lack of empirical study of the judiciary? Sharon Witherspoon, director of the Nuffield Foundation, provided the answer to this question when she wrote about why the empirical study of law was important. She said, like the White Queen, it is sometimes possible to believe six impossible things before breakfast when thinking in the abstract about how law works. Empirical studies play a vital role in showing how systems actually work and which of those six thoughts are accurate understandings. So I thought it might be interesting to think about what are a few things the White Queen might believe before breakfast about how judges work. And I've come up with a few. <coughs> One might be that juries rarely convict in rape cases. It tends to be a widely held view. The UK Supreme Court spends most of its time on human rights cases. That seems to be a view certainly prevalent in the media. There has for a long time been a widespread view that juries are biased against ethnic minority defendants. 
and there seems to be a view that Lord Kerr is constantly dissenting in Supreme Court judgments. My empirical research on all these subjects has been able to show that all of these are false beliefs. Uh, the jury project has shown that certain offences have either very high, the ones in green, or very low, the ones in red, jury conviction rates. So, I'll give you a bit of time to look at that. But, interestingly, rape is not among the offences with the lowest conviction rates. Juries in England and Wales convict 55% of the time in rape cases. And I think that has served to dispel quite a long-standing myth uh, about juries and rape cases in this country. So what about the idea that the Supreme Court spends all of its time on human rights cases? Well, actually, our UK Supreme Court project has shown that human rights cases uh, actually make up only a small proportion <coughs> of all the Supreme Court cases, just over a quarter of the cases. So in two-thirds of cases, the Supreme Court is not obsessed with the Human Rights Act. The jury project also found no evidence that juries discriminated against ethnic minority defendants. We looked at every single jury verdict returned at every court in England and Wales over a two year period and we found no substantial significant difference in conviction rates based on the race of the defendant, which I think is a uh, heartening story uh, of finding about the jury system. And finally, what about the <laughs> Well, in the UK Supreme Court project, we did find that Lord Kerr had the highest rate of dissents among Supreme Court justices. But if you actually look at the percentages, you can see that clearly he has only dissented in a very small proportion of cases, 15%. And Lord Brown had an almost identical rate of dissent. All right, so why does it matter that we study the judiciary? Understanding judges, courts, and the judicial system matters fundamentally because, as Jack Knight, a leading judicial researcher in the US, has said, the task of explaining the influential role of judges is a necessary feature of any adequate explanation of the evolution of law in a democratic society but it also matters practically if we are in the dark about judges. Jury research has demonstrated the dangers of being in the dark about juries. Detailed empirical research has demonstrated that almost all of the issues people were worried about regarding juries a decade ago, the six things the white queen believed before breakfast, were all false. Juries were not unrepresentative, racially biased, are unwilling to convict in rape cases. There is no mass avoidance of jury service by the British public, and jury service isn't only for those not important and clever enough to get out of it. The problem was that while focusing on these false concerns, other issues of real concern about juries had been overlooked, including juror misuse of the internet, their lack of understanding about what improper jury conduct is, their desire for deliberation guidance, and the need for written directions. And I'm pleased to say that all these issues are now being researched by the UCL Jury Project. <coughs> Relying upon untested beliefs about how the jury system does and does not work can lead to criminal justice reforms being introduced that are unnecessary and based on false assumptions. They may therefore not achieve their ends, or they may actually have a counterproductive effect. And of course, we know even less about professional judges than juries. The danger of the lack of empirical study of professional judges and courts is, on one level, the same as the danger of being in the dark about juries. Myths will abound, and reform agendas will be set by unsubstantiated anecdotes out-of-date perceptions of judges and courts, and perceptions based on media interest in certain issues. 
So while the White Queen sits at breakfast and believes the Supreme Court spends all its time on human rights cases and Lord Kerr is always dissenting, what are the real areas of concern for judges and courts that we might be missing? But the lack of empirical analysis is perhaps even more dangerous for the professional judiciary and the magistracy than for juries. <coughs> juries have a deeply entrenched level of support in this country, with the public, the media, and judges routinely ready to defend them. The rest of the judiciary lacks any real inbuilt public support. Professional judges are not elected for good reason, and they are not representative a point I will return to shortly. Judges are increasingly also subject to a greater level of public scrutiny and political discussion than ever before. This has come naturally with constitutional reforms that have expanded judicial responsibilities, the growing judicialization of politics and social issues, and the increasing deferral to judicial inquiries and reviews to address deeply controversial political and social issues. All of these developments bring judges increasingly into the public, political, and media eye. But when this happens, the lack of judicial studies in Britain means there is little empirical evidence to turn to, either to challenge or support claims made about judges and the court system today. So to give just a single example, Two months ago, Conservative MP George Eustace, who's the former press secretary to David Cameron in opposition, writing in The Guardian, stated the following as fact. Currently, the scope for judicial interpretation of privacy law is so broad that the outcome of a given case is heavily dependent on which judge presides over it. There has, in fact, been no empirical research on this issue to prove this claim but the lack of any empirical analysis of judicial decision-making in privacy cases allows such claims to go unchallenged and to attain an undeserved status of truth. Academics and empirical research on the judicial system can contribute to a better functioning justice system and better public debate about the judiciary. And tonight, I would like to lay out the foundations for a blueprint for judicial studies in the UK. This blueprint doesn't present an exhaustive list of specific topics to be studied. I want instead to highlight a few general topic areas central to the role of the third branch of government to illustrate the contribution judicial studies can make. The first area is decision making, and this goes to the heart of judicial studies. We've just scratched the surface in recent years with studies on juries, tribunals, and the UK Supreme Court but there has been no real, hardcore, empirical research on decision-making at other levels of the judiciary. At the end of her final Hamlin lecture in November 2008, Hazel Genn spoke of the need to develop a body of empirical research about judging, and in her words, especially judging in the trenches. To truly understand judicial decisions, academics need to think about how, de how decision-making in other courts can be studied in a realistic, rigorous, and responsible way. <coughs> but judicial studies encompasses more than decision making. It involves the judicial system. This is first and foremost about the nature of the judiciary as an institution. In the last two decades, there have been significant and far-reaching judicial reforms. From the creation of the Supreme Court to the fundamental reorganization of administrative functions of the senior judiciary, including the role of the Lord Chief Justice and the Lord Chancellor. From sentencing reform to removal of trial by jury in certain cases. From the merger of courts and tribunals to magistrate court closures and proposals to change working practices there. And of course, the creation of, com of a completely new judicial appointments process. Unfortunately, not a single one of these reforms has been underpinned by significant empirical <coughs> research that fits the three judicial studies criteria of being realistic, rigorous, and responsible. In addition, the effects of all these fundamental changes have not been systematically studied. So that was topic two for judicial studies. 
But judicial studies also includes attitude research. Empirical attitude research about the judiciary involves two things. The first is public attitudes about the judiciary. There is really very little current information about what, the public, what public views are about the judiciary here beyond some surveys which show that the public has more trust in judges than politicians and journalists. Uh, but perhaps that's not especially difficult these days. We actually know very little about how much the public knows about judges and their attitudes to the role, uh, <coughs> excuse me, and their attitudes to the role judges do and should play in society. But the second part of attitude studies uh, in judicial studies is judicial attitudes or judges on judging. This is about what judges them themselves think about judging and the institution of the judiciary. It, it, it explores what impact the changes in the institution of the judiciary have on judicial attitudes and judicial working life. At present, all we have is an anecdote and impressionistic information about the effect of recent changes on judges. Instead, I would argue, information needs to be rigorously and responsibly obtained through means that enable judges to express their views in complete confidence in anonymity. The research also needs to be done so that it looks at the possible differences in views of judges in different courts who work under significantly different conditions. And it needs to be done on a regular basis so that it is possible to revisit the same set of questions over a period of time. Right, I want to turn briefly to one judicial reform issue in particular to illustrate the value of empirical research for policy making on the judiciary. I have heard it said, I've been present on many occasions when it's been said that the judiciary in this country is the greatest judiciary in the world. Wearing my empirical hat, I'm afraid I have to point out that there is no international empirical study that ranks the quality of judiciaries. So this is a claim that is difficult to either confirm or reject. There have been some attempts to measure some aspects of judicial systems and make international comparisons. And it is certainly true that in comparison to many other judiciaries, there are very few incidents of corruption or serious misconduct in office by judges in this country. But on one issue, there is no denying that the judiciary of England and Wales does not compare well to many other judiciaries. And that is the lack of diversity among judges and the failure to rectify this over the last 25 years. I'm not going to explore here how the judiciary has, been able, has not been able to diversify itself, and I'm sure most of you will be very thrilled to hear that I'm not going to explore that here. I want to speak briefly instead about the need for a more robust approach to research in this area. Since the late 1980s, there have been numerous, and I think some would say endless, reviews, consultations, seminars, <coughs> summits, advisory panels, and parliamentary hearings, as well as legislative and constitutional changes on the issue of judicial appointments and diversity. And yet, how much actual empirical research has been done on the effect of the appointments process on judicial diversity in this country? As far as I can see, there has been only one, and that was the limited study of one level of the judiciary, deputy district judges, that I conducted prior to the establishment of the Judicial Appointments Commission over seven years ago. I believe that the lack of research and scholarship on this issue here has contributed to the, to the debate on this issue becoming sterile, repetitive, and ultimately unproductive. And I also believe it has indirectly contributed to the lack of progress in this area. The only other robust empirical research on judicial diversity has been conducted in other jurisdictions. That evidence clearly shows that certain strategies help diversify the judiciary without the use of quotas or any diminution in the quality of judging. So, time to wake up. I'm interested to see 
What all of you believe is the most successful strategy used elsewhere to increase diversity in the judiciary. Now, which of the following strategies do you think is most likely to increase diversity in the judiciary? And I'm not saying which do you support, I'm saying which do you think is the most effective strategy to increase diversity in the judiciary? If you think, you can see that, if you think that it's requiring judicial appointments boards to be diverse themselves, press one. If you think it's judicial appointments bodies being required to take diversity into consideration when they make appointments, you know, press two. If you think it's the appointment of one high profile uh, senior, uh, an appointment to the senior judiciary of one um, individual from an underrepresented group, you would press three. So that's one high profile senior appointment from an underrepresented group. If you think it's actually basing selection on knowledge as opposed to experience, that's four. And if you think it's political leadership, and that generally involves um, public statements by senior political leaders of the need for diversity, you press five. Ooh, this one seems to be a bit more testing than the other questions. So this is, remember, this is asking you which do you think is the most successful strategy? Not which do you think you would support, which is the most successful? And can I just say, judges, I'm not going to sing, separate you out from everyone else. <laughs> It's open again. Oops, sorry. I'm sorry about that. <coughs> In the way of technology, some things don't work. Uh, what I was going to tell you was, I'll see if I can get the answers up before the end. Um, the reality is that all of those strategies have been shown to be successful elsewhere. Not a si It wasn't a case that any one in particular was more successful than the other. Um, but some strategies are more popular or acceptable than others. So, now that you know that they all worked, what I'd like to ask you to do is to tell me which of those strategies you personally would support. And you'll notice I haven't given you the option of none of the above. Mm -hmm. So yes, that's true. <laughs> we've got a result this time. Okay. Interesting. Right. So, <laughs> um, the, the, the least support is clearly for a single high profile appointment um, to the senior judiciary or political leadership. Um, but you're all, there's quite an uh, overall good general level of support for uh, appointments board is being diverse, a uh, requirement that they're diverse, that is not the case with the JAC at present, there's no requirement that the membership of that body be diverse. Uh, diversity as an appointment criteria, again, that is not uh, 
in the guidelines or the practice of the current JAC. And interestingly, knowledge-based criteria. This is what is used in continental systems where judges um, become judges at a very young age, immediately out of university, and their access or their entrance to the, uh, to, uh, the judiciary is based really solely on entrance examinations. Um, right. Um, what I'd like to point out here, uh, first of all, thank you for that, and thank you for bearing with the te technical problems, but what I'd like to point out is that none of these strategies were adopted either in the Constitutional Reform Act, which created the new appointment system, or by the JAC itself. With no real empirical evidence from this country to contradict it, I think it is odd that this evidence based on 30 years of experience diversifying the judiciary in similar jurisdictions has been disregarded. Recently, many of you will be aware, after only a few years under the new appointment system and amid growing criticism of a lack of progress on diversity, we have had yet another period of reviews, parliamentary hearings, government consultations and proposals for reform. Yet none of these exercises involved any new independent empirical analysis of the new appointment system. As a result, all the recent reviews could do was rehash the old diversity arguments, which are based on little more than anecdote and personal opinion. What has now emerged is the Crime and Courts Bill, whose proposals for limited changes are not based on any empirical evidence, that demonstrates such changes will improve diversity in the judiciary. In addition, none of the proven strategies to increase diversity are in the bill. There is therefore not much ground for expecting that these proposed changes will have any discernible effect on diversity levels in the judiciary. Okay, but so much for the bad news. Um, the good news is that this is a good time for judicial studies in the UK. And there are several reasons for this. <coughs> the first is that American scholars have paved the way empirically. Lessons have been learned, methods have been developed, and conceptual frameworks have been established in the study of judicial decision making. We should not simply accept the findings of American research about judges as valid for judges here, but British scholarship can benefit hugely by drawing on the theoretical and methodological advances in judicial studies and applying them here. The second reason it's a good time for judicial studies is that the field is wide open in terms of topics to be studied. This makes it an incredibly exciting time for young scholars who can benefit hugely by drawing on the... <coughs> excuse me. Um, this makes it an incredibly exciting time for young scholars with an interest in the judiciary. They have a chance to learn from the experience of other jurisdictions and scholars and make a significant contribution to judicial studies in this country. Uh, and finally, the judiciary itself has clearly become more open, often speaking publicly about issues of concern to the judiciary. Judges have also recognized the need for research about the judicial system and both the judiciary and the Ministry of Justice have developed guidance and procedures for research with judges and courts. All of this comes amidst media concerns about the growing political role of judges. There are also two groups who I think should make a contribution to judicial studies in the UK here. The first is the judiciary. I hope we are increasingly moving to create a greater role for judges in academia. We need a greater crossover between academia and the judiciary, and I believe that judges can and should be scholars. It is important that judges contribute to the research agenda, and they can also play a vital role in ensuring that research is realistic and responsible. At UCL, we already have a distinguished judicial visitors program in the law faculty, and we've been fortunate to persuade Lord Collins and Sir Robin Jacob to join the faculty. Um, I'm also particularly pleased to announce tonight, for those of you who haven't heard already, that Lord Justice Hooper will be joining the Judicial Institute from September as our first Judicial Fellow, and I very much look forward to working with him then. The second group who I think 
should contribute to judicial studies is legal theorists. The difference between judicial studies and jurisprudence has been described as the difference between is and ought. While jurisprudence is concerned with, with what judges ought to do, judicial studies is concerned with the reality of judging. But judicial studies is not solely the empirical study of judges and courts. It is the study of the judiciary as a key institution of state. And at its strongest, it has always been a marriage of empiricism and theory. H.L.A. Hart, Britain's leading legal philosopher in the 20th century, did not shy away from contributing to important debates in his time about how the judicial system actually worked. So I call on my jurisprudence and legal theory colleagues, some of whom are here tonight, to step up and contribute your particular moral and theoretical perspectives to the issues and debates in judicial studies that really matter to the judiciary today. And finally, <coughs> why a chair in judicial studies and at UCL? Um, other than the fact that UCL's main building looks like a court of law, it's very appropriate that the first chair in judicial studies is here at University College London. UCL has a long history of pioneering research and teaching in numerous fields and in, and in establishing new academic disciplines in the UK. It's responsible for creating the first chairs in the UK, for instance, in the now very well established fields of architecture, history of art, and even Egyptology. UCL also has a founding principle of research aimed at, at addressing real world problems. And this is the key to understanding what judicial studies is all about. Jeremy Bentham has come to be known as the spiritual leader of UCL. And I'd like to think that he's sitting across the road in his cabinet saying, what took you so long? Uh, I think you may all be visiting Jeremy Bentham fairly soon after this, this talk. It has often been remarked that Bentham was not a great fan of judges, but I believe he would have supported the idea of the empirical study of judges and judicial decision making. He certainly felt judges were worth greater scrutiny, but I also believe that had he had the benefit of empirical analysis of the judiciary, he may well have held a less jaundiced view of judges. There is another reason why it's fitting and perhaps not surprising that this chair has been established at UCL, and particularly at the UCL Laws Faculty, and that is Hazel Genn. So I get my chance of revenge for having to do two inaugurals. I first met Hazel at one of the countless increasing diversity discussion groups convened in the years leading up to the establishment of the Judicial Appointments Commission. I was making a presentation and I was really heartened by the sight of Hazel nodding vigorously in agreement in the front row. I now know that she's so supportive of those giving speeches that she will even nod supported, supportably when someone is flailing around horribly. Whatever her view of my presentation was that day, I, was, I very much appreciated her support and I have been extremely fortunate in her continuing support ever since. We worked together on the study of the appointment of deputy district judges I mentioned earlier, and it was as a result of working with Hazel that I came to UCL. As most of you will know, Hazel and I have established the UCL Judicial Institute to begin to rectify the lack of scholarship on the judiciary in this country. The Judicial Institute's approach is for empirical research to serve as a starting point for a deeper understanding of judges, juries, and courts. It's also to have a research agenda that's devised in consultation with judges, practitioners, and policymakers, and for judges to play an important role in academia. This chair in judicial studies is also part of fulfilling that objective. But while it is a great personal honor for me to be the first professor of judicial studies in this country, the reality is that if this were to remain the one and only chair in judicial studies, not just at UCL, but in the UK, I will have failed. For this reason, unlike most inaugurals, this one really needs to be judged in the longer term. Creating a chair in judicial studies matters because ultimately, we must ensure that the judiciary is not, 
to quote Dickens, not Jimi Hendrix, a purple haze fast disappearing into black. Thank you. If I know one thing of Professor Thomas, it is that you are not going to fail. <laughs> I'm sure you'll all agree with me that the lecture was well worth the wait and that the Dean, as ever, showed her infinite wisdom in insisting upon it. I am persuaded of the need for much greater research and also for the need for much closer relationship between the profession, the judiciary and academia. I have never understood why in the UK we do have this divide uh, between academia and the legal profession which only few stars seem to cross and I hope that your efforts will produce a great deal of fruit. It sounds as if if I walk around the corridors of UCL it's going to be like walking around the corridors of the Royal Courts of Justice with the likes of Jacob and Hooper joining you and I am delighted that they are doing so. Plainly, research is necessary. I have just returned from uh, the Judicial College's course, The Craft of Judging, and one of the um, aspects that they were teaching us about, it focuses on the core skills that we all need across jurisdictions, and one of the aspects they were talking to us about was decision-making and confirmation bias. And it may sound fairly obvious, but it was quite interesting to hear the research about it. Essentially, it comes to this. If you form a provisional view before you go into court, the chances are you'll look at the arguments that support your provisional view and you'll underestimate the arguments that go against your provisional view. I thought about using this as an argument to persuade the master of the roles, my boss, that not only do I not need to read the papers, <laughs> but it would be positively harmful if I could so there's, there's an awful lot to be learned about decision making. It's the core of what we do, yet judges know very little about it. As I said earlier, we're thrust into it. So I know that Professor Thomas's work and the work of the Judicial Institute is going to be an enormous benefit to the system as a whole. But personally, I feel to, to, to judges like me who would like to know more uh, about the job that I do and how hopefully I can do it better. So I wish you every success, uh, Professor Thomas. It's been a very stimulating and um, fascinating lecture. I've enjoyed it, and I know that everybody present has enjoyed it. Um, and for those aging rockers in the audience, we soon got over our disappointment. It wasn't about Jimi Hendrix. So on your behalf, may I ask you again, members of the audience, to thank Professor Thomas. It now comes to the moment where I formally inaugurate oh, this stand. Oh, I have a stand up. I always say, well, I wish I had a sword. I don't have a sword, but I. You want, you want me to kneel? No, that's what you want. <laughs> I'm going to be at the cutting edge of tradition, and that oh. is I'm creating a new tradition, which is that at inaugurations, I don't actually touch you with a sword, but I yes. present you <gasps> with a, 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 a uh, professorial fountain pen. terrific lecture. It substantiates absolutely the wisdom of the faculty in appointing you as its first professor of judicial studies. I know that there's going to be an extremely exciting program of research and I hope that I will be a part of it mm -hmm. uh, if I have the time. And I invite all of those of you in the audience who are interested in the things that Cheryl has to say to stay in touch with us uh, because we hope to be doing a lot of work, uh, particularly with the members of the judiciary who we will this evening. Anyway, thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Cheryl, for a great lecture. Thank you, Lady Justice Hallett, for so kindly chairing the lecture this evening.